I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew chapter number 1. And our text this morning will be from verse 18 down through to the end of the chapter, verse number 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And of course, uh, we understand that there's two major accounts of the, what we call the, the Christmas story. And of course, the other part is in the book of Luke. And the book of Luke goes into, I think, much more detail regarding uh, the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. But Matthew kind of gives us an overview. And Matthew is kind of like an introduction to the main characters. Uh, you will note that Matthew opens tracing the lineage of the king uh, of the Hebrew people. And of course, Jesus was the son of Abraham and, uh, you know, the son of David. He was a Hebrew that was heir to the throne of his father, David. He was the son of man. And he is presented as the promised heir that would reign over his people. Now, in verse 18, the Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Now, I know some people, we don't talk like that anymore, do we? If we ever did. Uh, but, you know, listen, I, I realize people don't speak in phrases like that now, but can I just challenge you? Don't be afraid of unfamiliar phrases in our Bible. People will say, well, that's outdated. And I'll say, is it? You know, we use terminology like likewise, which means in a similar manner. We use a word like otherwise, which means in a different manner. And the reality of it is, is the term wise as a noun here simply speaks to the manner in which it happened. So when the Bible says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, it happened in this manner. This is how things went down. And of course, verse 18 through verse 25 gives the synopsis of how things played out. Now this morning, I want you to look at verse 21. And today I want you to consider some of the responsibilities that were given or that we see here in these last few verses. Notice the Bible says in verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Where am I here? Okay, in verse 21, I want you to notice that first phrase there. The Bible says, she shall bring forth a son. She shall bring forth. Now look down at verse 25. And the Bible says, and knew her not till she had brought forth. So as you look at verse 25, we understand that Mary had a responsibility, didn't she? Her responsibility was to bring forth that son. And as we come down to verse 25, we understand that she did indeed bring forth that son. It was through Mary that Jesus was brought into the world. Now, if I can make a parallel this morning, we have a responsibility to bring the message of Christ to this lost and dying world. Much like Mary was responsible for bringing Christ into the world, you know, we have a similar responsibility to bring Christ to the world. I'm reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to the Romans. He says, how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, we have been given the greatest message this world has ever known. And we understand it's a message that is often ridiculed. It's a message that is often mocked. But really, it's a message that has no equal and it has no comparison. 
Listen, if we were to look at all the different examples of good news that you know may have been chronicled throughout history, they all pale very small and minute compared to the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the message of the gospel. Paul uh, said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2 that when he came among them, he determined not to know anything among them save what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Listen, we have a responsibility to bring that Savior to the world. Much like Mary uh, was given the responsibility of bringing the Savior into the world, we have the same responsibility of taking the message of the Savior to the world. We understand today the world is mired in godlessness. It's trapped in its own philosophy and its own humanism. Listen, it's, it's corrupted through all sorts of wickedness. And secretly... It's aching for something. It's longing for something that it is missing. I look at history and, you know, for millennia, this world has sought peace. Now, how successful have they been? They haven't. Yet they keep talking about it. Listen, today, we have the opportunity to take Jesus to the world. In fact, if I can go a step further, not only do we have the opportunity, we have the responsibility to do it. Mary had a responsibility to bear Jesus Christ. She was to bring him into this world. She was the the conduit, if we can say that, uh, through which the Savior would be manifested to the world. You know what? In similar fashion, we are that same conduit. We are a conduit by which the Savior is to be brought to the world. And of course, as we read this passage and we read about responsibilities, the Bible says in verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son. We get down to verse number 25 and we understand that she did in fact bring forth that son. The Bible says, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. Can I say this morning that Mary had a responsibility? She fulfilled that responsibility. And the question for us this morning is, is, are we going to fulfill our responsibility? The second thing I want you to notice is that expression there in verse 21. It says, and she shall bring forth a son. And the Bible says, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Listen, not only are we to bring Jesus Christ to this world, but we need to declare his name to the world. The privilege of providing the name for this miracle child was given to Joseph. And and understandably, Joseph was put in a strange situation. A situation that obviously caused him to ponder uh, many things. And uh, today, I cannot tell you what was going through the mind of Joseph and the thoughts he must have had. But the Bible says in verse number 20, well, look at verse 19. It says, Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. I mean, here's a man who has not come together with the woman he's going to marry, she is with child. And, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking that there's got to be a lot of question marks going on. There's got to be a lot of things going on inside his head. I I mean, he, he is a human. And then the Bible says in verse number 20, but while he thought on these things, I am glad the Bible doesn't include the things that Joseph thought. Because I'm guessing they were probably all over the map. Here was a man, and I'm sure that he was struggling with the idea of what was taking place. The fact that his espouse was with child before they had come together. 
But as he thinks on those things, notice the Bible says, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So basically, as Joseph is there pondering and thinking and, you know, probably just scatterbrained in his mind, the angel of the Lord appears to him and I think in an act of comfort and an act of grace, he fills Joseph in on what God's plan is. Maybe not entirely, but just to maybe bring some peace to him. And here Joseph is given the name that was to be given to the child. He did not have to come up with the name. He was just provided with the name that he was to pass on. Notice those words. The Bible says, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Listen, Joseph was given the responsibility of declaring the child's name. And the name Jesus, I don't think it's a mystery to, to, to many of you, but the name Jesus simply means Jehovah saves or Jehovah is salvation. And I can't help to declare or to, to connect or, or draw an application for us. See, not only do we have a responsibility like Mary to bring Christ to the world, but we have a responsibility to declare his name to the world. The name of Jesus, or if I can say it, the reality that Jehovah does indeed save. Our lives ought to be a living, breathing testimony that God indeed does save. You know, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, the Bible speaks of Abel. And, you know, through his obedience, he, he obtained a good report. And one of the interesting things that it says there is that Abel, being dead, yet speaketh. I find that interesting that here is a man who has been dead for millennium or millennia, and yet he still has a message there. He still speaks through his, uh, even though being dead. But I think about Abel being dead, still speaking. Listen, if Abel, being dead, can still speak, how much more should we speak being alive? We can testify to how God saves through a transformed life. A transformed life that, uh, you know, according to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, is no longer conformed to this world. Listen, as we put on the new man, that new creature that's created in Christ from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, what we are doing is we're declaring the name of Jesus. If you're going to bring Jesus to this world who is in desperate need of that message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, listen, you had better back it up with a life that lets the name of Jesus stand out. You know, oftentimes uh, what happens is, is believers will try to preach the message, the gospel that we're to preach, which is great and wonderful. But a lot of times what uh, our lives uh, will portray is not the name of Christ, but it's our own name. It's our own pride that comes forward. Listen, people ought to be able to look at us and they ought to be able to see Christ in us. We ought to be able to declare his name through our actions and through our behavior. Look over at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 17. The Bible says, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And 
In verse number 11, the Bible says, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. And notice it says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, Joseph had a responsibility of declaring the name of of Jesus to the world, didn't he? He was the one that was told there in verse 21, it says, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Do you realize that Joseph could have said, you know what, I think this would be a better name. Maybe uh, I want to go this way. But look what the Bible says in verse 25. It says, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name, what? Jesus. You know what that tells me? He was given a responsibility, and Joseph went out, and he fulfilled that responsibility. He was told to call the name, or name the child Jesus, And he did exactly that. Let me ask you this. Will you, like Joseph, declare the name of Jesus so the world may see and hear? When you walk through those doors, would you determine to allow your life to be a living testimony to the fact that God indeed does save? Isn't that what we ought to do? Listen, we ought to be preaching the message of the gospel. We ought to be bringing uh, Jesus to this world and letting them know uh, about Jesus Christ. We ought to be that conduit by which Jesus uh, comes to the world. But listen, as we preach that message, our lives ought to be able to tell people that, hey, God does save. Look at me. God has saved me. Man, what a change. What a difference. Man, if we just continue on being conformed to this world, if we just continue on living the same way as we lived before we came to Christ, and we go out preaching that message, you know what people are going to say? I don't want anything to do with that. Man, if we're going to preach the gospel, our lives ought to show the gospel that it actually has some merit and some effect. You know, I look at some responsibilities here. I see uh, Mary was given a responsibility and Joseph was given a responsibility. Notice what, how the Bible continues. It says, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. It says, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, if I can just say this this morning, again, I want you to be careful here. Just to understand the passage as it's read, there isn't a Gentile anywhere near this verse. Okay, his people are the people of Israel. And of course, if you go back to Jeremiah 31, you'll understand that God had promised to the house of Israel and the house of Judah a new covenant. And we go over to Romans chapter 15, verse 8. We understand that, uh, you know, Jesus Christ, his ministry on earth was to uh, confirm the promises made to the fathers. It was to bring that covenant and to fulfill those promises. It was a covenant that was to forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. It was a covenant that would save his people. Of course, we know in the book of Acts, as his people rejected the only sign that he promised them, which was the resurrection, that that salvation turned to the Gentiles. You can read about that in Romans chapter 11, verse 11. I often call it Operation Jealousy, because the whole purpose was is to provoke Israel to jealousy. Of course, now we understand we live in a time where God is no respecter of persons. He does not favor one group above another, but all who believe that Jesus died for their sins, of course, we know they'll be saved. Jew or Gentile, for there is no difference. Look at Romans chapter 5 with me. Romans chapter 5. Verse 
This is a, something that is often overlooked. I've, I, I've taught it and preached it, and I think many of you here uh, would appreciate this, but it's something that I think is skipped over and glossed over. But look what it says in verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Listen, we need to understand today that Salvation is by the life of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's the life that he lived. You know, the big problem that we have is we live in a body of corrupt, sinful flesh. Paul calls it the body of the sins of the flesh in Colossians chapter 2. And of course, we know that this body has been given notice that it's going to be destroyed. When Adam first took of that fruit, he knew that all that would eat it shall surely die. And we know that death came because of his sin, because of his disobedience. But Jesus came, and he lived in a body of flesh, just like you and I. Yet he was able to do something that no other man before him was ever able to accomplish, or any other after him for that matter. He was able to live a life in the flesh that was perfectly obedient and submissive to his heavenly Father. He came and he lived a righteous life in the flesh that none of us ever could. And of course, we know when the devil came knocking and on the door of temptation, Jesus never opened the door. Even when all the Pharisees, the scribes, the priests, and the elders uh, tried to tangle him in his talk, he was always miles ahead of them. And no one had success in derailing him. Listen, the one success that they thought they had was that they were able to get him crucified. But again, they were, weren't aware of what God's plan was. They weren't aware that at any time he could have called legions of angels and stopped it all. Even though they were complicit and they wanted him dead, it was Jesus who willingly laid down his life. Listen, he lived a life that was perfectly submissive and perfectly obedient to his father. In fact, you look at some of the testimony that was said of Jesus. What did Pilate say? He said, I find no fault in this man. The centurion who looked upon him after he had died said, surely this was a what? A righteous man. Jesus himself said, I do only those things that please the Father, and not my will, but thine be done. Peter wrote that there was no guile in his mouth. Folks, he was perfect in all aspects. Even under the worst of circumstances, under the heaviest of loads, uh, Paul uh, recorded in Philippians chapter 2 that he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And folks, he was obedient right up until the very end. Never flinching, never failing. And folks, it is through his perfection, through his perfect life, that we are saved. The point I'm trying to make is is that the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 21, it says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He fulfilled... His responsibility. He took the body that was prepared him from Psalm 40, verses 8 through 11. And you can read about it in Hebrews chapter number 10. 
He took that body that was prepared him and did everything. I mean everything according to his father's will. Never once straying. Never once being disobedient. He was completely perfect. He fulfilled his responsibility. You know, Mary had a responsibility to bring forth a son. She was the conduit by which Jesus would be brought to the world. Joseph had a responsibility to call his name Jesus. Jesus had a responsibility, and that responsibility was to save. And can I say today that they were faithful to their responsibilities? We need to bear our responsibilities. You know, like Mary, we need to be that conduit that brings Jesus to a lost and dying world. Like Joseph, we need to declare his name before the world. Let our lives be a living testimony of the fact that Jehovah does save, that God does save. Let people know that, hey, God saved me. And let my light. You know, as the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, you know, it says, from ye you sounded out the word of the Lord. We need to spell it out for people. I can't help to think that if we take our responsibility of bringing Jesus to this world, declaring his name before the world, that Jesus, in fact, will be faithful to save. Would you be willing to take upon that responsibility? I want to encourage you, as we head into this Christmas season, have a responsible Christmas. Have a responsible Christmas. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Father, uh, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Lord, I see some examples of people here in this account that were given responsibilities and they fulfilled it. Father, like whether it was Mary or Joseph or Jesus himself, had instructions and had responsibility and Lord, we see how they bore their responsibility. Father, I pray that you would challenge our hearts and speak to us. That we too would go forth from this place. That we would bear our responsibility. Lord, that we would bring Christ. Be that conduit that would bring Christ to a lost and dying world. That we would declare the name Jesus. Testifying that you indeed do save. So that we can see Jesus fulfill his responsibility and save those that are in need. Father, this morning challenge us that we would be responsible this Christmas season and moving forward. Challenge us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.